thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kathy and this is Amber. Hello. And we are coming to you today from the Oregon Zoo's Butterfly Lab, where we'll be talking about one of the zoo's longest standing, and I think most exciting, conservation projects. So for those of you wondering, everyone at the zoo is healthy, and Amber and I will be sharing that commitment to safety by wearing these face masks throughout the live. Mm -hmm. Because we're live, feel free to throw any questions you might have in the chat, and we will try to answer as many of them as we can. And lastly, thank you so much for those of you who've donated so far. It has been overwhelmingly wonderful to see the, you know, to see the contributions from our community. And so if you feel so inclined, we would love any more donations you'd be willing to give to support our work. So Amber, can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about where we are today and what happens here? Yeah, definitely. So we are currently in the Oregon Zoo a Butterfly Conservation Lab. Um, so it is not located in a public area of the zoo. It's actually behind the scenes. So um, some people have seen it because we've had tours back here before, but uh, most people don't know it's back uh, behind the giraffe area. So when you pass by the giraffes, we're back behind the scenes in a quiet space um, that's perfect for our butterflies and our larvae. It's where the tree kangaroos used to be a really long time ago, exactly, if anybody yeah. remembers that. This space used to be, it's been a lot of different things. Yeah. Though. And now we use it for the butterflies. Yeah. Cool. Can you tell us what you do here? Yes, definitely. So um, behind us, if you can see, we've got all of these racks and they're full of butterfly larvae. So larvae are um, basically caterpillars. So it's the stage before the butterfly. And what we do is we raise um, them up, up until a certain instar and then we release them out into the wild. So out in the wild, basically 1% or so of, of eggs actually end up in turning into adults. We want to improve that, especially because these guys are threatened. Mm -hmm. So we rear them here in the lab where we have really great conditions. They don't have to worry about predators and we'd like to get um, as many of them to survive as possible into adulthood. So we give them the space that they need to become adults and then we release them out into the wild so that they can go out and inhabit their their native habitat. Cool. Speaking of conditions, you can't tell because we're on video, but it's really warm in here. It's warm. <laughs> can you tell us why it's so warm? Yes, yeah, so they do end up going through, so we like to mimic their, their um, environment out in the wild. So during this time when they're eating a lot and they're growing a lot, um, it is the summertime. So we do um, give them a heat cycle so they will eat a lot more when it's warm. Um, they are temperature dependent, so when it gets cold, their metabolism slows down. Um, they slow down and they'll start to sleep more. And then when it's warm, they're a lot more active. So we want them to grow as big as they can and eat as much as possible to help them survive out in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, so we do give them a heat cycle. And then this room will also cool down to mimic the cooler temperatures that um, the coastal area experiences once um, the sun goes down. That's pretty awesome. Can you tell us what are these labels on each of the boxes, it's like a code. Yes, so there's a lot of different labels. So um, the first label, like 1A, we wake them up at different times. So I'll talk a little bit about the wake up process since I'm, I realize you don't know what, why they're waking up. Um, but we have three different batches. They'll get woken up once, three different sets get woken up once a week. Um, and that's what the 1A, 1B, 1C is. And then the second label, the MH02, that's actually a label that tells us who their mom was. Oh, cool. Um, and so each different MH um, means that they came from Mount Hebo. So the mother originally lived in Mount Hebo, and she was the fifth butterfly that was caught there. And she laid all the eggs that turned into these larvae. Awesome. Grace and Rebecca want to know, how long do butterflies live? Grace and Rebecca, that's a great question. Um, so the butterfly themselves only lives about two weeks, but they can end up living um, in, especially in human care, they can live upwards of 40 and 50 days. Um, we take really good care of them and give them quality food. Out in the wild, the average is about two weeks. They do have predators um, and there's changes in the environment that affect them. Um, but if you take into consideration the entire life cycle of the butterfly, which includes larva, um, it's a whole year that they're mm -hmm. alive. So a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. Otis wants to know, what is a cocoon versus a chrysalis? Which is the right word to use? So there's a lot of different words, Otis. Um, you, cocoon and chrysalis, those are common words. Those are correct. Um, we call them pupa. So they're all proper terms, but here in the lab, we call them pupa. So when they pupate, when they become a, a cocoon or a chrysalis, um, we call it pupation. And then when they come out of it, it's called eclosion. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. 
So Karen wants to know, Amber, for you personally, what is your favorite butterfly? Well, that do you have I, a favorite? I, I love all butterflies, Karen. <laughs> um, but I do, I, I mean, I've worked with Oregon silver spots and um, checker spot butterflies here in the lab, and I've gotten to see them through their entire life cycle. So I think I have to say the checker spots and the silver spots are my favorite. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, Aaron. Okay, this is a great question, I think, for everybody. But Aaron asks us specifically, what is the importance of a butterfly? Why butterflies? Yes, Aaron. So that's amazing. Everybody should know butterflies are important. They are pollinators, so they help to fertilize plants all over the place. Um, these guys are nectaring, so um, that when they nectar at different plants, they help to cross-pollinate um, different plants and, and give us the wildflowers that we see out in the coast. Um, but pollinators, are, in general, are really important to agriculture. They allow us to have the food that we need to sustain life. Um, they're also a really great indicator of how well an ecosystem is doing. Where you find butterflies, you'll typically find, out, find other invertebrates. So if there aren't all that many butterflies out there, you can kind of think that maybe other invertebrates aren't doing as well either, mm -hmm. um, which tells us that we need to protect them because pollinators especially, like I said, they're really important to agriculture. So we need to work as hard as we can to keep them thriving. So they can be a sign of a healthy ecosystem? Yes, definitely. So Stacy wants to know, you mentioned waking them up. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? How do you wake them up? When, why, all that? Definitely. So I mentioned earlier that their life cycle is about a year. So people don't realize that. So I can take you quickly through the process. So right now we're actually ending our, our year. Um, so pretty soon in August is when we're gonna be taking females from the wilds who have already, we're assuming have mated and, and have eggs in them that they're gonna be laying. In August, we'll take them, um, they'll lay their eggs and then they'll hatch sometime in September Oct and early October. They'll go into what they call diapause, which is when they have a big sleep. <laughs> it's an eight month sleep. Wow. Um, so it's diapauses. Um, basically, they, they do move around a little bit, but they don't eat uh, when they emerge out of their eggshell. So when they hatch, they eat their eggshell, and that's all that they eat for those eight months. Um, they'll go to sleep, and so we keep them in a very cold environment because that's what they're used to out in the wild. And from October to May, they sleep. So that's a long, long time that they're alive, and they're just sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, when we wake them up, basically we take them from their cold environment, and we warm them up slowly so that they... I feel like it's spring and so that's in May is when we wake them up because that's when they would be waking up out in the wild as well. Um, and so we just warm them up slowly and they take that environmental cue and they start eating immediately. I feel like it's kind of like having one of those lights that like slowly wakes you up over time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Tiffany wants to know where do you release these friends? So these guys, they're a coastal species. So we do have several sites that we release out um, in the Oregon coast. Um, some of the ones that are, are public areas that I can share, um, the Stucca Bay National Wildlife Refuge and Saddle Mountain are two of the sites that we've released to. We actually just had a release of 276 larvae yesterday up at Saddle Mountain. Cool. Um, it's closed right now due to the, to the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, but we had um, our partners have keys, obviously, so yeah. we released out there. So we're showing some video of that right now, as you're yes. seeing. Um, that was actually the first time you and I met, is when we hiked up Saddle Mountain to release yes. some of these butterflies. It is. So, yeah, definitely. It's one of my favorite things to do every great. year. It's amazing. It feels really great to connect to nature and um, to bring these guys back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you ever see our staff out there, definitely ask them what they're doing. It's a pretty fun, fun thing to witness. Yeah. Let's see. So Melissa wants to know how long are they most and Liam. So Liam is this question comes from Liam. Um, how long are they caterpillars before they turn into butterflies? Liam, they are um, caterpillars. So they're the larva for about 66 days. So we've got this little guy here who's a, pretty much a third instar larva. And instar um, is when they molt. So they start off as really teeny tiny caterpillars that are so ridiculously tiny it's almost it's so hard to to comprehend because they're tiny so that's why we have these microscopes um, and thank you to the portland garden club for our beautiful setup that i can show you here um, so the, they go from a really tiny size and then they go all the way to bigger caterpillars you can see this guy munching <laughs> really enjoying that little flower there um, and then they'll go into their pupa stage so it's the whole thing it takes about 66 days um, that they actually live as larvae and some really cool things that we have down here 
um, if you can see them, are their molts. So I talked about instars. So they do grow. And in order to do that, they have to shed their skin. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually the sheds that they leave behind. And you can see they grow. So they go tiny little sheds all the way up to their sixth instar shed, um, which is right before they go into a pupa. Awesome. And Grace? Should we take a quick look at the pupation? That yeah, looks? let's do that. Oh, yeah. So we've been really lucky enough to capture the pupation process on video, which is amazing. And this one's actually a checker spot. Oh, yeah. And so checker spots, I mentioned, we also um, help to uh, captive rear them here in the lab and release out in the wild. So they are a similar species. Um, they have different habitats, but they're both natives to this area. Such a cool video. Yes. And if anybody knows anything about the caterpillar, you know that when they become a pupa, so um, they basically turn into goo. So it's an amazing process. They make their little case and they turn into a goo inside and then they reconstruct themselves into a butterfly. What? So when they close, they'll be fully winged and beautiful. But it's amazing that they go from this little caterpillar here to goo to a butterfly. That is so cool. I'm going to throw up the uh, e enclosure. Yes, the eclosion process. Um, again, a vocab lesson. So eclosion means when they emerge outside of their pupa case. And it can take well, a few a while. Um, they need to dry out their wings because they are a little bit wet when they come out. Um, but it is an amazing process to see that them come out of their pupa case. Awesome. Grace wants to know how much do you feed them? Grace. So we feed them basically as much as they will eat um, when they're really teeny tiny. Um, we give them three leaves for about a group of 10 per day. And um, every morning we check them and we see if they've eaten all of it or if they have left a lot of leftovers. And then we add more based on that. Mm -hmm. um, in their lifetime, one larva will typically eat 200 leaves. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So yeah. Madison wants to know, how has global warming or climate change affected butterflies? Maybe even specifically these butterflies. Madison, that's a great question. Um, like I mentioned before, they are dependent on the environment and temperature is a really big part of that. Um, global climate change has changed that because um, these guys specifically only eat one plant, their host plant, which is the viola adunca, the early blue violet. Um, and so if the plant will grow based on the environment and if that doesn't sync up with the way that they're growing um, out in the wild, the way that they um, change and how they grow, how fast they grow, then they pretty much miss each other and there isn't enough food for them to eat. So um, the environmental cues are really important. If it's warmer um, than years past, then they'll grow a lot faster. But if the plants are drying out, then they won't have enough to eat when they are bigger, which is when they eat the most. Mm -hmm. um, if it's colder, then they'll take that cue and go to sleep for longer. And if the plants are growing during that time, then they're going to miss out on, on that. So um, the environmental parameters basically are super, super important. And if they're changing from what they know and they can't catch up or learn fast enough that things are changing, then that's how they die out. That's amazing. So we've got some questions about moths. Can we talk moths for a second? Yes. So Lori wants to know, are moths part of the butterfly family? Lepidoptera, mm -hmm. yes. So um, they are different, though. Um, and one way that people like to um, kind of tell them apart is um, when they're butterflies and moths, moths can tend to hold their wings out to the side oh, like a tent. Cool. Um, so they'll, it's kind of like they're covering their legs. <laughs> and then the butterflies will hold their wings up against their body. So you won't see them. If you're looking at them, they're really skinny. Uh, so that's one way. Mm -hmm. And the second way is their antenna. So butterfly have really long, thin antenna with a little kind of bump at the end of them. And then um, moths have more feathery antenna without that bump at the end of it. Let's talk some action steps for people. So yes. Beckett and Lucas want to know what plants can they be growing in their backyard that can help butterflies? Beckett and uh, Lewis? Beckett know? and Lucas. Lucas. Beckett and Lucas. So. One thing that everybody can do is really simple is plant native plants. So native plants are super important. Um, one of their biggest issues with the, with these guys, the silver spots is, is that their food source, uh, the early blue violet is getting crowded out by invasive species. 
Um, so invasive species removal is a big thing, and then planting native plants in your garden um, and trying not to introduce invasive species into an environment. Those are the biggest things you can do. Do you have any favorite native plants that people can look for? Um, let's see. I, I don't know. I'm not a huge plant person. <laughs> Unfortunately, I should be, um, but I don't have a garden. Um, but these guys specifically, they love yarrow and um, Yarrow is the one that sticks out to me, mm -hmm. um, not as, as caterpillars, obviously, but as butterflies. Um, they nectar on yarrow and California. There's something, California, I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, just look up um, ca oh, California aster and Indian thistle. Those Great. are some of the favorites of the butterfly. Um, so those are some that you can plant, but of course these guys are a coastal species. So um, if you live on the coast, you might, that might attract them. But if you live here, I would just suggest planting in any natives. I bet your local nursery could help you figure that out. For sure. Too. All right. Well, that is kind of all the time we have today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we are so excited to welcome you back in the coming days and weeks to the Oregon Zoo. We hope that you'll come back and see us and all of our animals. If you feel so inclined, our donate button is there and all of your support just means the world to us. So. Thank you so yes. much, Amber. This was and, amazing. Oh yeah, and if I can just give a special shout out to um, our yeah. partners, we are not able to do any of this work without a big collaborative group of people. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Forest Service, Oregon Department of Corrections, Coffee Creek Correctional Facility, they grow the, fl the violet leaves that we feed our, our little guys here, uh, Institute for Applied Ecology, The Nature Conservancy, Woodland Park Zoo and Sequoia Park Zoo. So we all really work together to make this happen. I think that's one of my favorite things about this project yeah. is how collaborative it can be. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody.